Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Doctors Running Podcast, where we, a group of doctors of physical therapy, talk about the art and the science of the things that we put on our feet. Today, we are extremely excited and honored to have Ultra join us, both Brian and Alex. Thank you, both of you, for coming on. I have, We have a lot of questions for you, and this has been something we've been looking forward to a while and trying to schedule stuff around all the busyness of the holidays. So appreciate both of you coming on. Yeah, it's my, my pleasure. I know we had to cancel before I, I got sick, so I apologize for the delay, but uh, really excited to have this conversation and to, to chat about some footwear. Yeah. This is Life probably hap- eight yeah. weeks coming because of like the different <laughs> scheduling yeah. difficulties we've had. And we don't make it easy on people because we record on Sunday nights. So yeah. anybody who's willing to join us on a Sunday evening is just really, uh, just really extra and awesome. Yeah. So thanks for yeah. doing that. So I'm going to take a really a brief moment to introduce Ultra, but then I will let both of you take the reins on this because obviously you're going to know this better than anyone. But Ultra has had a unique perspective, and I got to brag about you two and the company a little bit, where create like kind of some of the original individuals with creating foot-shaped and zero-drop footwear, and Brian, Alex, I'll let you kind of tell some of the backstory on that. Uh, my connection, my like minute connection to Ultra is Ultra and the footwear there. When I was in college at University of Puget Sound a long time ago when dinosaurs were still ro- roaming the earth, I'm just kidding, um, was one of the first companies that got me thinking about what I was putting on my feet and starting to ask deeper questions. And I think that was something great that you really did. Some of the original reviews on this website, again, back in the Stone Age, was the original Ultra Instinct, the 2.0, the Ultra Repetition, which I'm always curious if anybody remembers that. That was a solid shoe. I really, really enjoyed that. <laughs> um, I've also got to give a shout out to Brian that when I was in college, I emailed ultra and brian was nice enough to send me a personal email responding to some of the questions i had about kind of what was going into the thought on zero drop footwear and some of those things and it was a very cool experience for a very green individual just getting into this that hadn't even started this yet so appreciate that there's appreciate the connection here but brian alex if you two could introduce yourselves and a little bit about ultra that would be awesome for some we obviously know but for the listeners that would be great if that's okay yeah, um, Brian Beckstead, uh, I'm one of the founders of Ultra, and it's been just a, a wild ride. I'm sure we're going to go into all sorts of details and all this, but I, I've been an avid runner. Um, first day of high school, I actually met uh, Golden Harper, yep. who ended up starting Ultra with me. And um, really, Golden, we'll talk a little bit about this. He, he's definitely very creative, and a lot of the mad scientists coined the term zero drop. And so um, him and I became very close both in high school and college. And have a background at, at run specialty. I started working at a running store when I was 16 years old. I just turned 42. So uh, that's all I know um, is is footwear and running and, um, you know, no business background, but I somehow managed to start a, a pretty good shoe company and it's worked out quite well. So uh, we'll dive into some of those details, uh, I'm sure, throughout the podcast, but really excited to be here. I think that Ultra does come from a very technical background, both Golden and I um, have degrees in exercise science and biomechanics. And we love talking about that, which I think really is unique in the footwear industry, having young, um, you know, biomechanics, science driven, unique alternative type of footwear, which, um, is something I'm very passionate about and really happy to be on the podcast and talk in more depth about ultra. Wonderful. And Brian, one other question that I have for you is, I know you've, you were a co-founder of the company, so you've brought yeah. it up from its roots. What is your day-to-day kind of involvement with Ultra look like now? Um, still very deeply involved, or do you have a different kind of role? What does it look like? Yeah, it, it is It is different. You know, for a long time, I started out doing the sales um, and kind of the head tester, I guess. And then it evolved to where I became president for five years of Ultra. We got bought by VF Corp uh, in 2000. Uh, 19, 2018, I guess, acquisition 2018. And then the company moved to um, Denver. And so I stayed back. It just, that was, it was a very stressful time and it was just a lot of busyness. And so now I'm still in the senior leadership team. So I make a lot of more, a little more of on a consulting role, but I primarily do PR, right? I, mm-hmm. I tell the ultra story. I'm able to do speaking engagements and training sessions. And then I still do testing with Alex. I re- we were reviewing some shoes last week in Denver together. So cool. I still am involved in that. And uh, I also do very strategic projects for the brand. You know, uh, my latest project is we've been doing a, an outlet where we actually sell 
the used shoes that people return to us because of our guarantee. So it's a reduce, reuse, recycle program and so forth. So I have my hands in a lot of pies, but I don't, I'm not necessarily involved in a lot of the major day to day and decision making processes, but uh, I I definitely am very, very involved in the brand. Awesome. And Alex, what about you? Yeah. Speaking of Denver. (laughs) Yeah. So (laughs) yeah. uh, Yeah. Alex Lind, uh, senior product line manager for, for ultra i uh, been with the brand now coming up on five years. It'll be five years yeah. this June. Uh, so really m- made the move over when the, the brand moved out to uh, to Denver. And um, it's been a lot of fun, but mm. sim- very similar to Brian. I, I started when I was 16 at a running store here in here in Denver. Um, lucky enough, my, my dad's good college friend owned the, the shop. And um, yeah, really just kind of worked my way up there. And I, I think I was like 24 25 and realized the only way i could go up was like own the the company which of course i had no <laughs> no money whatsoever so i've always wanted to get on the brand side and uh was able to become a tech rep with another brand and kind of work my way up into uh into the product side and um this opportunity came came about with with ultra and i was i like jumped on it the second second it was uh posted and it's been fantastic ever since and it's such a great brand. And I know Brian's going to go into a lot of the history of it, but uh, it's, it's so fun because it, it's still such a young brand, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's so rooted in, in just a lot of the, the fundamentals and there's such a good foundation of the brand, um, which is really cool. And I actually, Brian, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I remember meeting you since we're talking about like first introductions <laughs> and first meetings. I think it was 2011 in the basement of the runner's roost. And then we actually met at TRE in 2012 at, oh. uh, and I remember you selling in still. So I don't know if I've ever said that, but, uh, kind of coming I think full you mentioned something sure. about the runner's roost meeting and, and unfortunately yeah. I meet so many people and I no, have a terrible I, I, memory. So I apologize, <laughs> but you know, I will say that I, I, Alex has been great because I think that as we go into a, a larger corporation, I think having a really technical knowledge and just a passion for, for the industry and for footwear um, I think Alex has done a great job these last five years. We're really happy to have him on the team. So on that note, speaking of technical, I'm going to ask a very general question, and this is very open-ended because I'm just curious to hear what you're thinking. Ultra really started, I mean, there was a couple of the companies that had like, like barefoot minimalist stuff back when that was coming out, but Ultra is really one of the first ones that had a zero drop and an anatomic sh- uh, sh- shape in an actual shoe, right? There was no fingers to it. There was none of that other stuff. It was actually a traditional amount of midsole material with the original Ultra Instinct. It's been a minute since that, right? It's been over a decade since the original Ultra Instinct. I'm curious to hear from both of you, what do you think, like, what's the current state of the industry on zero drop and and having anatomic toe boxes? Because it's been a while and a lot of other companies have t- taken notice. So what do you, where do you think we are now compared to over a decade ago? I think that something that, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, you you started ultra and zero drop is great. I think one thing that we don't get credit for, which I think is really exciting that has happened um, since ultra launched is in 2011, when we launched outside of some of the smaller barefoot shoes that you were talking about, every like we're using absolutisms here, every shoe was on a 10 to 14 millimeter drop. Um, It was there was no concept of drop. It was, Mm. this was it. And so I think that introduction of drop didn't just create a loyal following for zero drop enthusiasts. It also, because of the the benefits that people felt when they tried the shoe, every shoe company has lowered their heel heights and their drop, which is, I think, something I'm probably, I'm just almost as proud about as Ultra itself is that changing the industry in terms of looking at engineering looking at shoe construction and that's just the drop part we start adding that foot shaped toe box which is when we talk to our consumers today um there seem to be just as if not they're they're actually they are definitely more interested in that toe splay than they are in the drop which i think is really cool for ultra that the zero drop which has always kind of been our flagship unique trademark people almost talk oh well you know i'm used to a four drop or a six drop or an eight drop where we never had that conversation in 2011. The concept of drop wasn't even there. And so I like the fact that the industry has changed so much there 
um, that the state of the industry, we talk about toe boxes now where that was not a conversation. We talk about the drop in shoes. Uh, we look at engineering constructions very, very differently. And you see a lot of new brands that have taken off in that space, ultras amongst them, amongst a lot of other brands that just weren't even a thing uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Hoka on come to mind. Uh, and Ultra, of course, you know, is some of the three that might be the, the, the flagships of those. But there's a lot of other brands and then existing brands that have had to change and evolve. And it's just been really exciting and fun that we now have options. Um, when hmm. 15 years ago, when we were talking about Ultra, it was, well, my air is better than your gel and my gel is better than your yeah. hydroflow. And my high, there was, that's <laughs> all it was, was just these really... in, inset cushioning absorb, right? Yeah, it, yeah. There was cushioning system arguments. There was no discussions on, on the, the overall engineering of the shoes. And to be able to pioneer that and influence that has been awesome. And I, I think that the industry is just better off across the board. I believe that other brands are better because of that influence and having those good discussions and having options. So um, that's uh, something I'm really excited about as I've seen this evolution in, in footwear of the last you know, 10 to 15 years. Yeah, it's interesting to think 10 years ago, one of the conversations when we talk about 12 millimeter drop shoes now that those are actually extremely rare. So it's not yeah. that, you know, having variety yeah. is act is really important. There are people that do well with a 12 millimeter drop. It may not be that many, but yeah, the variety that we have now is incredible. Back during that time, I was running in racing flats because it's the only thing I could find that gave me that variability. And it was like pulling teeth trying to find like looking at heel offset and things like that going, yeah, you know, I'm trying to shift load um, down to my ankle rather than having it excessively in my knee and hip because I was struggling with IT band stuff and I was trying to like redistribute some of those forces. So it's very interesting now that we we talk about this over a decade later that now the, industry, the entire industry, the norm seems to be more on the six to eight millimeter drop range. And you have in a ton of zero or low drop shoes from major companies and it's just a normal thing now. Whereas then it was like super rare, like you said, to find anything under 10 to 12 millimeter. And so now it's the opposite. It's it's getting harder <laughs> to find those. So it's, it's, yeah, a very interesting shift. Alex, what do you think? Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I think, you know, you know, growing up around run specialty and, and uh, going through the fit process, I, it's been really nice because I, I think it's taken it away from being so prescriptive um in, in a run specialty setting right where it's, it's a little bit more collaborative yeah. with with the runner and, and consumer and, and i really like that i think the power power is in a really good spot where yeah. um you know before it was like uh, i'm just going to go grab you an adrenaline i'm going right. to grab you a tooth out you know um where now it's it's a little bit more of of who they are and, and the experience that they're looking for and, and i think we're all getting smarter because of that um you know i like thinking very progressively in that regard yeah. where we can always get better and and I think that the consumer and, and quite honestly, the brands, retail, everybody's everybody's getting better. Um, one thing I do want to shout out as well that I think the brand has has absolutely changed and, and kind of led the charge is, is with guide rail um, and not having these over corrective shoes. And, you know, that's that's something internally I always talk a lot about that we should be really proud of as well. of Just rethinking what, you know, guidance or support stability, however you want to talk about it, uh, you know. To me, Ultra has, has really led the way uh, with that, you know, and I, I think that's something that uh, that Brian and, and Golden and the, you know, the team is, is should be really proud of as well. But but yeah, I think just this constant evolution for the, the consumer has been great. And uh, I think a, a lot of it has to do with this brand that came out during minimalism that you couldn't put it on the, the minimalist side of your wall and you couldn't, right. you know, you kind of had to explain it when it was on the, the more traditional side. Um, and it's been good. It's, it's been kind of you know, really just a brand to kind of shake things up a bit. It's hard to remember, you know, you know, for me, when, when y'all started, I was not uh, deep into running yet. Even uh, I I'm a late to late to life runner. I started recreationally in college, but it's hard to picture that time, like transporting back. What did it really mean for ultra to drop a shoe? So I'm thankful that y'all shared that a couple of things um, that I'm thankful for too, is in the area of uh, era of minimalist footwear in the Vibram five fingers, I have webbed toes. So I could never wear those shoes because I couldn't get my toes in them. So I'm thankful y'all didn't go that route. I think the second thing that was unique too, is you kind of had this, you have this crossover between zero drop, but also having cushion underneath the foot where you kind of bridged that you, you just, you, you spanned yep. categories where it couldn't quite be put 
decisively somewhere. So I think that's super interesting. And Brian, you had mentioned um, that you and your the the co owner or co founder, you you have yeah. this background in kind of um, biomechanics and exercise science, and that kind of drove some of your thoughts. Can you talk about at that time when you were starting the company? What were those benefits that you were trying to shoot for? What sort of experience were you trying to get towards? Um, what sort of biomechanical ch- advantages, changes, whatever were you thinking about? Yeah, I think our our we've been talking that since day one. Um, I, I we used to do VHS tapes in the late nineties um, at the running store and watch people, and we never did the, bio, the the pronation thing. We all we, we never ever thought that the pronation thing was real. We we would argue with our sales <laughs> reps nonstop about this, right? And so. The, the, the biomechanic thing became a passion really from 1997 onwards for me. Um, mm-hmm. And that's something that we always talked about. And that was because of Golden's dad. He was really into the whole biomechanics and we watched everybody run. We never bought into the, the video camera and watching pronation thing. We, we just never bought that. Right. And I think the goal for us is, is when what we would do is we would watch people run in, in shoes, video analysis. And this was from 98 all the way up to 2009 when we started mm-hmm. Ultra. Um, we would watch people run and in shoes, and then we would watch them run barefoot on grass. And the way that they would run barefoot on grass was how we wanted them to run from a biomechanics version. But we, we recognized, you know, for us, it wasn't a minimalist thing. It was a biomechanics thing. And how could we create the benefits of a traditional footwear and still allow people to get away from excessive heel striking and, and being able to take away some of that lower leg torque and we talked all about it, and that's when um, we started hacking off the heels of our shoes. Um, so we would – it, it kind of went through a whole – started with a toaster oven, went to a bandsaw. And, and, and the whole goal here is, is that we were trying to just get people to land a little bit more natural, right, a little mm-hmm. bit more underneath their body. And we were trying to do it so it wasn't super technical either uh, where kind of a, a original – you know, a layman's person could get it. And what we found is is with the with the zero drop, it just – we would just watch it. It was just, it was awesome. Like people would just run better, you know? And so that's when we, rather than starting a shoe company, we were just retail store managers. We went to all the major shoe companies and showed them our, our, our analysis and our concept of zero drop. And what we'd do is we'd lace all of the shoes with, uh, with Y. So we'd skip those lower laces and size people up a full size. And so we would, we literally gave, I mean, I met with, Dockney and New Balance and Mizuno and Lost Sportive. I mean, I met Brooks. I met with the sales reps and even shoe designers from those brands at trade shows saying, mm. we have a concept. We gave away our concept for free to the other brands, mm. um, uh, showing the research on, hey, the people run yeah. better. They run with better biomechanics. If that big toe can engage, you don't need a big dual density posting, right? That's what it does naturally, you know? And so we had all these conversations and uh, they wouldn't listen to us. Um, And so that's when, along with Jeremy Hallett, who I think would be very much considered the third founder, uh, the three of us decided to start it on our own. No money. Mm -hmm. We had no cash, no money. And, but the whole purpose was to get people to run better, right? To get people to, to uh, hopefully, right? The goal was to reduce injuries that, Hey, all these other brands are identical, and how do we do that? Um, as we were starting the brand, that's when the Born to Run and Barefoot thing came up like crazy. And we'd already Wild. started Ultra. We just couldn't get the funding. And so we're literally pulling Talking our about hair timing. out going. Yeah, good yeah, timing so, on that one. You know, a lot of it was lucky, but at the other yeah. time we were like dying to get funding because it was, that's nice, but man, you can have the benefits of that and the benefits of traditional footwear. And we felt that we were that perfect middle ground um, and it, you know, a lot, so many people pinned us as a minimalist brand. Um, mm. we had the same forefoot as every other brand, the instinct, yep. our first shoe and the lone peak and yep. the same exact forefoot cushioning as a ghost or a, a Cascadia, which were yep. popular at the time, you know? And so, but the whole thing was to get people to just run better. Um, mm. so that is, that was it. That, that was, was what set you apart from a lot of the other minimalist mm. and barefoot brands at the time was that you still had enough cushions. So someone like me, cushion. 
Yeah, you'd cushion. So someone yeah. like me, I was yeah. running a hundred plus miles a week and uh, wasn't doing that so hot trying to continue to run in like racing flats and and Vibrams. It also didn't help my coach absolutely hate Vibram, hated Vibrams. So he'd like chase <laughs> yeah. me down when he saw me doing my second run in them. He'd be like, Kleiner, what the, I can't, we said we keep this PG, so I can't repeat what he would say. But um, yeah, it was nice to have something that I could finally do that was that was working for my mechanics at the time that wasn't bare bones, which, you know, there's great stuff to the minimalist concepts. And mm -hmm. I think it works really well for the, for certain people. But in today's age, I think the majority of runners out there typically aren't willing to put the time necessary right. to actually adapt to running in a very, very minimal shoe. And we found that out very quickly as people started having more stress fractures and, and bone stress yeah. injury and stress related injuries. Cause you know, you know, shoe cushioning, we've talked about this before, you know, how it actually functions is, is a different story, but still having something under your foot can be beneficial with some of the more traditional, um, surfaces that we run on in, in today's world. But it was very ultra was different. And that again, you got pinned as a minimal blend, but you weren't, it was we weren't. just, yeah. <laughs> you know, trying to have a different concept and give people an option for people that didn't want a high drop or tapered toe box which was just the norm at that time it's also interesting that i don't know if you know this that ben onig um up in calgary yeah. during that 1997 to 2009 he was dumping that stuff out like crazy going hey this whole pronation paradigm isn't really doing much Is, like we, we need to we, we need to start thinking about this like for a small yeah. group yeah it works awesome but not everybody else mm -hmm. we read every bino nig article we could get our hands on we'll, yep before and while starting yep. ultra he was very mm -hmm. much um i've never met him in person but he, his his research and his philosophies uh were a massive inspiration in, in mm -hmm. the founding principles and the early design concepts of ultra that's wonderful so, big fan alex i have to give you a shout out because when you said um hey like in you know kind of back in the day for all of us when we worked at running stores the class thing a lot of times instead of collaborating with people it would be to go and like hey i'm gonna go grab the adrenaline yeah. the gt2000 i just had like several years worth of flashbacks when you said that <laughs> by the way <laughs> having worked in fit right northwest and foot traffic was where i started in oregon long ago um what, uh, from an ultra perspective and your perspective, how has working at the brand kind of changed that for you? And what's been your experience in watching this from originally an outside perspective and now being inside ultra yeah. for what Brian was yeah. talking about? Absolutely. Yeah. I think, um, you know, there were, there was two things just immediately. Like it was, I think it was <laughs> within my first week, we were in this temp office, everybody's moving. Um, and the two things that I think stood, stood out to me the most, or not, I think I, I know stood out to me the most was. Um, one, the brand was, was still really young. So it was, it was still very malleable, um, which was super exciting selfishly for me to be able to come in and, um, you know, previously I'd been with a brand and, and it was always like, ah, we should do this. And it kind of always ended there a little bit, you know, in terms of like, yeah, you know, but th there's this huge machine that we kind of have to fight against and we're dealing with decades of creating product and, you know, we, we can't challenge it too much. Uh, the ability to kind of come in and, and really like, talk and try and make the best possible product and collaborate with great designers and developers and get the, it, that was awesome. Um, and then the, the second thing that I, I really loved, and this was actually, it was before I officially started, but I went to a sales meeting for Ultra and it was actually Brian presenting. Um, and it, it just kind of clicked where, you know, a lot of other brands, they, they present the shoe as the solution. And uh, Ultra was not that way, right? Ultra was, was really meant to work with you. And yeah, maybe it's a solution for, for some people, but it's, it's not this cure-all. And it's really that, that piece that's meant to work with you as opposed to like fight against you in the ground and, you know, kind of be this mediator. It's like, no, it's, it's a little bit more harmonious than that. Um, and that's, that's been something I've really enjoyed. And, and it helps us, you know, really create product as well to make sure that, you know, there's kind of this guiding star. We we have kind of a purpose statement, right? Which is, you know, inspiring the world to move naturally. And, and that's something that just from a product side, we always remind ourselves or we always have that as our North star because, you know, naturally can be so many different things and, and kind of manifest in so many different ways, but uh, it's really exciting to kind of keep us moving. So, you know, it's probably a long answer there, but those were some of the most exciting things just initially when I joined the brand. Cool. 
So I like the term you said, again, not, it's not a solution for everyone, which is great, right? It's providing options and hopefully something that can help people work better. Now, Brian, Alex, can I challenge you on a few things that I heard? Do it. No. So I'm curious. <laughs> what, so, like, what, are they, what are they going to say? No, you can't. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. We're just trying to get, get hey, I'm a, right now. I, I'm, a, I'm a clinician. <laughs> I got to get consent first before I like jump, jump after. So I'm curious when I, because I, I had the same thought process and now hearing the, the thought process of variability is really important. So Brian, when you say natural running, what, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to you now? I'm curious. Yeah, I, I think that that's something we've debated about that word and that usage and what it means for 15 years. And we continue to use it. And it's sometimes it's really hard to define. Um, for me, I have severe scoliosis. Uh, I wore a back brace for 12 years as a child. Um, every night, my mom would strap it on and I would sleep with it. I still have back pain consistently. And so for me, um, natural is trying to align me because I am misaligned. So alignment to me is always very, very, very important, right? And so that's where the zero drop or for us, we're even doing low millimeter, low drops now, right? Yeah. We're trying to just get people better aligned. You know, the toe box, you know, this is not how babies are. You can look at any one-year-old, two-year-old or four-year-old, their feet don't look like this, right? They look like that. I also spend a significant amount of time in South America and I see what growing up barefoot in natural environments looks like. Our American feet don't look anything like people that grow, you know, the feet that look like they did a thousand or 2000 years ago or indigenous populations. Um, and so that's what we're trying to get at with that natural term, right? We're trying to do it holistically with your body. We're trying to maximize your alignment. And, and then the next thing, and, and this is, maybe jumping ahead a little bit, um, but it's about the experience that you have in the shoes, right? And that's what we really want. We're not trying to force you to do anything with our shoes. You know, we have some shoes that encourage, right, or slow down the rate of pronation, like guardrails. We're not trying to stop pronation. We're not trying to, you know, and so that's the type of things that uninhibited, un unleashed, uninhibited things that we like in footwear while still providing some general support and cushion. Um, and, and so we've actually split out our shoe line into four, four lines hmm. where it used to be, you know, pronation and neutral, right? Then it was minimal and maximal. And our, ours are feel, float, forward, and fast. And so what do you want to experience in ultras, right? Do you want to have a more of a feel? Those are going to be our lower cushion, our escalantes, our superiors, our lone peaks. Do you want to float? That's your torrent, your paradigm. Do you want to have more of that rocker, more of a forward? Well, that's, you know, we, we have a, a four millimeter drop shoe with a bit more of our toe rocker. Um, and then we have fast shoes, right? And so for us, it's really trying to connect the consumer on a more primal level on what they're experiencing in our shoe rather than being prescriptive or forceful or dominant. We're trying to just make it a little bit more fluid, a little bit more natural, both in the experience and then, of course, in, in, in the biomechanics and even the bio uh, and the running form and alignment and so forth. That's interesting to me. And I'm, I'm noticing a couple of companies doing this where they're kind of they're moving away from categorizing things based on pronation or cushioning level because it is confusing to consumers and they're starting to move we've talked about the the run cat scale extensively here and alex you mentioned this where it's a lot more about collaborating with the consumer and trying to give like help them subjectively know what they're looking for because people don't know how to describe what a 12 but most people don't know how to describe a 12 millimeter drop shoe or like a max versus minimal cushion everything you put something on somebody's feet most people are going to describe any amount of foam under their foot as oh this is a supportive shoe and we're like well that's defined as cushioning but yeah okay um all right so having that subjective experience is, is great especially because the more we know the more we're starting to realize and I say this as a biomechanist finishing up a PhD in biomechanics, that biomechanics don't always match to the subjective experience and don't always match to what actually might work best for someone. A lot of times, not always, it's all, but frequently the subjective experience that tends to be most predictive of what's going to work. So it's interesting that that is the way. So obviously we're on the same page here. That's obviously where you're going. So, and I've got a question for you both too. And I think a lot of people probably have... <clears throat> had probably i guess in the run shoe geek world right so we our, our audience they're all interested in footwear to some extent uh obviously interested in running 
I, I think a lot, one question that people are asking is, what do you think the room was like when they decided to not have a zero drop shoe anymore, to put a lower drop, four millimeter drop shoe, when you dropped this shoe here, I'm holding it up for, for people that, to see. Was that a pun? Pun it, yeah, I was about to say, pun <laughs> yeah. intended on that one. Yeah. Oh, what did I even say? I don't even know. <laughs> when you dropped the shoe? Oh, <laughs> no, not I guess it should, been ele- it should have been elevated the shoe, right? Because you lifted the... No, there we go. Kidding. But yeah. so when you when you brought this shoe out, what was the room like? Was that a hard? Was that like a very difficult conversation for your team? What what was it like to consider that? What was the stimulus to say maybe we should add some drop? Curious to hear what that conversation was like. And for the people just listening, by the way, Nathan is holding the ultra forward up. By the experience. way, yeah. board experience, board experience. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I forgot the last part. Yeah, Brian, do you want me to take that one? Yeah, I take it because you know when when the when it all happened, I wasn't in the office. Everyone just looked at me, and I was like, <laughs> you know, yeah, we, we've we I'll I'll go real quick on this. I'll let Alex go into more detail. Um, I mean, we've had requests for this for twelve years. This is not something that we reactionarily did. We had shoe designs of this in two thousand eighteen before VF bought us. We had prototypes of insoles that had little wedges, right? So that you could transition down. This mm-hmm. is something that we have talked at nauseum. And so, but when VF bought us, obviously we were like, hey, these are some of the f- future ideas that we could consider expanding into. Um, and then Alex, of course, was one of the spear- spearheaded a lot of this. So I'll let you go into some of those details, Alex. But um, it, it, it was almost a kind of a, it's about time you did this reaction. Um and, and and as a founder, yeah, I got a few, oh, you sellouts, you did it, whatever, yeah. right? For every one of those, I think I had yeah. 10 people were like, yeah. oh, man, that, uh, this is going to be so awesome. I'm so excited. This, you know, so it's it's been a, the it's been exciting, to be honest with you. So, Alex, I'll let you go into go more of the technical details on the room and the decision making processes there. But to me, it's a, it was a no brainer, a natural extension of our brand. It was the right time to do it. I, I will yeah. say really, really quick that it's funny that you say c- the insult comment that when I was first wearing ultra because my Achilles tendon couldn't always handle the zero drop. I used to take and I used to buy because you would sell additional insoles. I would buy them, mm-hmm. cut the heel off, put that in the shoe, and that would give me just a little heel elevation that would take that stress off that made it just right. So yeah. it's good to know that that was yeah. a long time plan. Just again, not saying one drop is best for anyone, but having variability for the different like bodies that we have is is great so yeah i well, i guess i'll take it away it's like it'll, i guess technically it's like chapter four of the uh the ultra drop saga so um i'll just talk about the, the current but yeah we uh joined you know june 2019 and september 2019 is really when we were like okay let's get it all together um at that point i you know got out in the marketplace talked talked to a lot of a lot of just managers, owners, right? Sales associates. And and like Brian said, you know, question always came up. Uh, and wh- I think one thing that really stuck with me when we were talking was uh, it wasn't like, oh, you guys are this throwaway brand and I don't care about you until you bring, like, you're not serious. It was a lot more of like, I love your fit. Your fit is awesome. I, I'm, you know, I'm 55, 60 years old and I just, I've tried and I can't do it. And I really want you guys to, to, add some drops so I can wear it day in and day out. Um, and so it was kind of nice because to Brian's point, like we didn't, you know, for me, I, I don't ever want to be called a sellout as well. Like I want to remain authentic to the brand. Um, so we felt like, you know, we, we really had this, this kind of guide for us where it's like, yeah, this is for a, a consumer right now that they actually get us. Right. But maybe they don't necessarily, they're not able to, to join us right now. Um, and so, yeah, we, we started ideating and, uh, we actually came up with, with a shoe with what we called dynamic drop at the time where we were trying to get out like a highly compressive foam. So similar to what Brian was talking about with the insoles. Um, and we, we tried all these different, different concepts and tried to get there. And, uh, we even started testing, testing out like a torrent and we were making torrents with drop and torrents with, you know, dual density from, heel to four foot. So, you know, it was almost like a, you know, kind of a fake drop sensation. At least we, we tried all these different things. And uh, one thing that we really wanted to do is make sure that we didn't simply just make a torn with drop. Um, and really this goes back. It was, this was really the catalyst of the silos uh, that Brian touched on where if, if we knew we did torn with drop that, that would have been just so inauthentic. Right. And it felt like just a, a money, money grab. And you guys, that, that to me was selling out and that mm-hmm. even as a PLM 
And so it kind of evolved into this, okay, well, yeah, we want to add drop, but how can we elevate even the ride underfoot a little bit more uh, and get more of that kind of rocker shape right and just have it feel more efficient on foot? And so that's that's kind of how we got to where we're at today, where we wanted it to be, you know, four millimeter drop. We had talked to, you know, some chiropractors and some physical therapists in the in- area that were big fans of us. And um, they were pleading with us. You know, they they're big Escalante racer fans like they like our most minimal, minimal product. But they're just saying, you know, we feel like if you guys come out with like a three to four millimeter, it's it still feels right. It feels authentic to us. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, we, we kind of found found where we wanted to be and then we just really wanted to make sure just the underfoot ride uh was also just distinctly different from everything else that we had uh in the line currently so yeah it took took a while but uh we finally got there and even working with some of our retailers they i think we we got ready for like every bad question and all the retailers were like awesome let's do it like you guys <laughs> like we did not yeah. have many hard conversations. Cool. It was no. quite easy from our sales reps, internal team. And it, I think our internal team was, you know, they saw it coming. They saw the amount of research and the time and energy that we put in it, that it is a different experience underfoot, right? And it is ultra-esque. And it, it just, it, it has those tweaks that, that people wanted and asked for. Again, you know, we can be stuck in our ways, but at the same time, consumer want something different in their experiences as time goes on. And in 20 years, they're going to want something maybe a little bit different. And I hope that Ultra can expand mm-hmm. um, naturally and still stay true to our core, right? If you like a Lone Peak or a Torn or an Escalante, um, the, the, they have a pretty similar feel now as they did three, four, five years ago, right? And so mm-hmm. we have that consumer. We have that. We want to expand um, the brand, the experience underneath foot, and um, just grow. Yeah. And Alex, you, I think we did you, a good job. Yeah, it's it was a fun shoe to to run in and just to get get a slightly different experience that still it like you said, it still felt like an ultra, but it was categorically different because you did yeah. have a little bit of a rocker. It was a little bit stiffer front to back. So you had some notable differences. And I think I, I you know, I've, I've just been curious of how did that conversation go? And I think that the merge between the categorical shaping of your lines and the introduction of this were more harmonious than if you were, like you said, just to throw something out there. Something yeah. you mentioned, Alex, too, was that you were talking about how you're playing with different densities of foam to kind of create these different um, sensations of maybe a fake drop. The idea there being, I'm assuming, a more firm, denser foam in the heel and then a softer one in the forefoot yep. to sink in. Have you um, had any issues in your testing as these foams do progress in our ability to make them softer and more resilient and more compliant, have you found any issues with not just being zero drop, but starting to sink into like a negative drop when you have the same density throughout? Is that something that you've thought about or, or how do you approach that? Uh, yeah. So aspect? definitely. Yeah. Some we, we've thought about and, you know, we, we hear about, right. There's some concerns and um, this goes back to even before, before myself and um, the team, when they were in Utah, uh, they, they took a bunch of worn pairs and, and I'm definitely kind of, jumping ahead here, but they took a lot of uh, worn pairs and actually cut them. And they, they had actually found just, you know, greater pressure in the forefoot. Um, you actually ended up getting a little bit of drop out of the shoe as it was worn. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that negative heel effect, I've, I've really kind of talking with our developers and wear testers. Um, a lot of times it's more of a sensation that, mm-hmm. that they're receiving and it's almost this kind of feeling of instability. Uh, but it's something that we, we want to make sure we don't go too soft, especially with our high stack product just to make sure that you're you're not you know falling back you feel like you're on like a bouncy house um but yeah. it's it's something that you know we we're aware of but but we've found just when we're out there and, and when we're talking with people they're really not actually having that uh, that occur it might be a sensation that they feel just from like some instability things like that but not necessarily something that's like oh man all of a sudden i'm in like you know earth shoes which i think we're like was it negative six? I think. Yeah. What it was. Yes, they were. I'm glad somebody else knows what those were because I actually oh, yeah. had a pair of those and definitely contributed to some Achilles tendinopathy. Yeah. But that's fine. Um, it's it's interesting to hear that because again, I that was a, a big concern that I originally had for certain people like myself that are heel strikers. And I think Brian, you kind of addressed my question where there there is variability, right? There, 
everybody lands differently. What natural means for different people can be completely different. Even, you know, if you start looking at individuals in other countries or in developing countries who are barefoot, there is also variability in foot strike. People have very different ways of moving and shoe can influence that. A shoe can also not influence that. That's totally different on the person. It is interesting to hear that a lot of that sensation that, that's still in the majority of people, you're going to still start compressing more the forefoot. But that does make sense that when you take somebody and put them in a zero drop shoe or something lower, there are biomechanics that at least visually may not change. But people start always usually start loading the forefoot more. So it makes sense that as you get used to it, you actually create a drop as you break the shoe in. So that just is interesting to hear that confirm because that's where the load shifts to right footwear what you have on your foot changes often where things are getting loaded not necessarily change how much but it definitely change where things are going so that's interesting to hear that it's also interesting again by the way that so talking on the same thing brian you mentioned you know the understanding some of the changes alex that you mentioned are happening in terms of the four millimeter drop before i go any farther before i lose this thought it is totally normal for people listening and you two are going to know this that it takes at least three to four years for a, a company to take a new concept and get it to market. So when you said that, it was like 2019. I'm like, oh, that makes total sense. Why now we're seeing this because it takes that long to develop it, wear test it, get everything ready. So for those listening, that's a behind the scenes thing that we've we've heard. So all kudos to you on that. It takes an immense amount of work. It's also funny because all the people we've talked to in the footwear industry are usually like, hey, when something comes out, they're like, didn't that's just coming out now? Like. We're, that didn't come out a while yeah. ago. I was like, yeah, because you're working on what what's like three to four years from now. So I get yeah, it. We so, just launched like there, the Lone Peak that. 7. Most people have Lone Peak 7. So like Lone Peak 8 just launched last week, yeah. right? Well, we're working on Lone Peak 10s right now. Right. Like, yeah. it, it's like... <laughs> That's normal. It's, this it is, is, yeah. Like, yeah. like the 9 is almost done and it comes yeah. out next January, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. like it, it takes... The, and that's an existing product. Right. When you talk about new or innovation, these new that you're talking three, four years. When you're talking yeah. inline, you're talking... 18 to 24 months. Right. So, yep. um, it's, it's, I'm glad you recognize that. Cause a lot of the end consumers, we they don't. don't, they have no concept that yeah. right. we how try to long tell them this process takes. <laughs> yeah. We're, we'll give you a hard time about concepts. But we also understand how much time it takes to go into this. So we'll try to be a All little right. nice. So my, yeah. my, my comment, my, my question though, is so you, Brian, you mentioned again, going to other countries and seeing how feet develop when you haven't had shoes or you've been at zero drop uh, or like it, a lap toes allowed to move. How does that apply with a U.S. consumer who has been in shoes their whole life? And maybe, you know, like certain people, their mechanics or their like biomechanics can change certain people. They can't. Has that influence at all? Some of the changes you've done and what you've done with in terms of your uh, what are those? What's the term? The the concept of anatomic, because people have noticed that you've changed fr from just having kind of the mm -hmm. wider toe box to there's some of the models that actually have a standard and there's actually a more I'm forgetting the term that you use. And I apologize. Like, it's not narrow, but it, we're going away. We're going. It's gone. We're going Got away it. from that last one. But, Got um, it. you know, yeah. I think that you had like the the early days were the idealistic versions of ultra. Right. Yeah. Um, that's your lone peak, your superior. We had the instinct, which I think an Escalante is pretty close. There you go. Holding up a lone peak right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, our number one selling model. Five. Right. And I think these are going to be a little bit roomier in the toe box, right. And a bit lower cushion. And I think that golden and I, as you know, elite athlete, you know, maybe not, I was never quite elite, but fa fairly competitive. I, I I've won a lot of ultra marathons. I've run, you know, 1400 mile, 100 mile races raced all around the world, you know, fairly competitively, right? Like we're, we were diehard athletes. We recognize that sometimes that's, that's idealistic, right? And a, a, someone who's never run at 45 years old, they want to get into running. There might need, you know, we started with, you know, the fit, right? And they don't need it quite as roomy. We have our original fit and then we have more of our standard, which again, it's less about the width and it also has a bit to do with the volume as well. So it's kind of a combination little bit less wide, but also the volume top to bottom as well. Those are two very different things. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, you know, a lot of people just needed more cushion as well as they transition into a zero drop. We found that the more cushion, the easier it was to transition, off, taking that pressure off of the calf and, and the Achilles, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think there was just a natural addition. You know, we added in the Torin, then we add the Paradigm, right? We add the, there you go, it's holding there them up, right? Go. So we have this progression that really is consumer-led, and how do you stay true to your core, but also hit what like 
the consumer wants to buy today or tomorrow, right? And how do you find that balance? Um, and we've had misses, <laughs> repetition. Uh, we've had wins. You <laughs> I know. liked it. Um, <laughs> no, it was terrible. terrible. Um, <laughs> I know. It know. was. I remember and having a hard time like, selling that shoe. I might have been the only person that liked it, I the, guess. Yeah, the forward experience, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, it's probably the least non-ultra that we've ever launched. And yet, yeah. it also has just enough ultra DNA, and people love it. Right. So we've had our wins, we've had our losses, and I think there's just this natural brand evolution. We still have Escalante Racers and Superiors. The Lone Peak is still our number one selling shoe as a brand. It's yeah. not like we have completely gone over to this other pendulum, right? We've stayed fairly true with these natural evolutions, and I think that you have to do that. I still personally, okay, Brian Beckstead believes that a person should probably be the healthiest in the least amount of cushion that they personally can handle and take the time and energy to transition to, right? But I think as a brand alter, we recognize that that's just not realistic and you have to do certain things. And I think we've done a really good job of finding that balance. It's not been perfect, right? We've made mistakes, but I'm really proud of that evolution. So um, my little ultra, so this is going to be, I have a question at the end of this story, but my ultra love story okay. is that I was on a kind of three night backpacking trip uh, in Great Smoky Mountain National Park with some friends. And I was actually wear testing some other shoes and we were going the opposite direction of the through hikers. Like every, I mean, it was most through hikers were wearing the Lone Peak. And I had not yeah. worn a lone peak up to that point. And I just kept like looking at those shoes. I'm like, I got to try that when I get back. That's what I got to try. And I got, I got this pair, which is lone peak five. And I got it and I put it on like, darn it. I wish I had that for that trip because <laughs> my feet were like in pretty rough shape. You know, I was not in backpacking shape, uh, being from central Wisconsin. It's not just like my natural thing to be able to go do that. And I just, I fell in love with this shoe. I, I still use this shoe to this day. And I have the eight here as well. The one that just dropped. Um, and there are some notable differences over these three, but they still have the same kind of DNA. Um, my, my question for you is you have a lot of these shoes that have kind of maintained their roots. Like these two shoes have a lot of similarities. There's a little more structure in the heel, a little bit stiffer of a toe box, maybe a little less volume. Um, but there's a lot of the same DNA. And then you talked about kind of these expansions and these going different directions. And you, you've came out with a, a, a carbon plated shoe in the last couple of years too. So what do you see as kind of the direction of ultra in terms of innovation? What sort of new frontiers are you going to be trying to go towards? Um, or, and, and what things are going to be staying the same? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll yeah. let Alex take that one. That's his, that's your job. That's, that's yeah. his job. Right? <laughs> Literally a job. Let's yeah. Let's see. Yeah. We'll, we'll see if I make it through the week after this. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, you're you're going to be fine. Your, yeah. your, no, your, your yearly evaluation Alex. is right now. Right. 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 Just kidding. Yeah. No, it, it really, you know, from a, an idealistic standpoint, from our end, it, it really goes back to, to these silos. Um, you know, when we pre silo, we'll, we'll call it, and, and these silos are, pretty internal, right? It's not necessarily something that we're going to be jamming down uh, the consumer's throat and yeah, I have to be in this. Um, but before, it, and you know, Nathan, you were holding up a Torin, we were just trying to make Torn for everybody, right? And we're trying to make Escalante for everybody. And, you know, when you do that, you kind of make it for nobody. Um, hmm. And really what the the silos have allowed us to do is, is make product a, a bit more purposeful. So to answer your question is exactly what you were talking about with like Lone Peak, Lone Peak, we're going to, you know, we're going to be much more methodical, maybe even stubborn in our approach of, of how we evolve and how we update. And, um, you know, Brian, Brian is the Lone Peak effectively. <laughs> yes. I'm, like, well, I, I'm not just saying this. I've because heard of this. The, yeah, yeah, he's he's our wear tester. You know, even, you know, uh, our, our president, she she comes up and is like, well, does Brian like the Lone Peak? Like it's it's that <laughs> it's that, that serious. And uh, so people we, we always know. say like, oh, the Lone Peak's awesome. It's not, you made the shoe just for me. I'm like, no, I literally made it for me. So that's his baby. You know, I, I didn't make it for you. Trust me, I made it for me. So. <laughs> We'll be in meetings like after I present it and I'll be messaging Brian. I'm like, well, what do you really think? Like you could, you know, tell me, um, <laughs> did you but, mess but, you my know, kid up or is it still correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and so that it really just, if we want to be a little bit more purposeful and methodical. And I think a great example of that, um, coming up is the new Escalante. Um, I'm super proud of what our team did because we really just good. took 
everything of what was great about the Escalante and just kind of like distilled it down. It wasn't crazy in terms of innovation or evolution, um, but it's just making it better for, for what that, that runner is looking for. Um, and then, you know, float for us is our, our really cushioned, you know, stable product like Torrin Paradigm. Um, that will be, you know, still, still evolve a little bit faster than feel. Uh, but not necessarily as quick as something like forward or even even fast silos. Those are the two two categories that we feel like we can really like evolve and kind of push the limits a little bit more. Uh, and you're really you're going to see that with compounds, with with design, um, material, everything. Those those are going to be the focus of like, hey, let's get after it. Let's find where this this new consumer is. Um, and I think quite honestly, that's where a lot of the brands are going for. So it's, it's exciting. But yeah, for our, our feel, our float product. It's going to be a little bit slower in terms of the evolution and, and really making sure that we're not not alienating who's there now. And then for forward and fast, it's like, yeah, let's let's just try and find the best possible experience that we can for those those runners. Cool. And is, you know, the innovations that are going to be happening in that forward and, and fast departments is a lot of the uh, impetus for the the changes that are adopted. Are those going to be based off of kind of running economy? Are they going to be based off of wear testing with people who run certain types of races? Are you going to be focusing more on the trail, on the road? Kind of what's, what are going to be the the things that move your needle one way or another? Yeah, great, great question. For for the fast product, um, so our Vanish Carbon, right, our Mont Blanc, we, uh, we're definitely focused on on wear test and uh, we actually have an innovation team who uh, who works really hard, just making sure it's it's the best possible setup. Um, and what I mean by that, right, is they're they're doing a lot of the lab testing, and then we're actually comparing that with the wear testing um, to make sure that you know both objectively and subjectively it, it feels fast and it feels right for for the consumer for that runner out there. Um, and then experience, you know, I think we we get really excited looking at new compounds and and just understanding what people are looking for when they're running and how we can best deliver that. Uh, you know, I. You know, a rocker shape is not necessarily new, but you know how we can kind of package it up and, and really provide it to the, to that runner um, is something that we're looking for and we, we want to crack. But all you know, at the end of the day, all while still making sure it's ultra and uh, not really alienating who we are at our core. Slightly off topic. Yeah, and, thank and, you, and I think it was Golden that mentioned this, but thank you for making rockers that don't actually become toe spring especially in the forefoot yeah. that is very very much appreciated and i do notice mm-hmm. and i do talk about big that deal, big fans of toe vamp not toe yes. spring and there right. is a difference there is a difference but toe vamp eats into the midsole right, right. where toe spring would in would as actually going to be in the fit yeah pulling those yeah. toes up we don't yeah. do much toe spring we do yeah. toe vamp where we take it out of the midsole yep. um, which is great and i will chime in here that when you talk about road or tr- or trail ultra is really one of two brands that dominate in both areas, right? Mm-hmm. That's, which is really exciting for us. And I think that you're going to continue to see that from us, that we, we don't consider ourselves a road brand or a trail brand. And the end consumer, I don't even think considers us one or the other. It might be a little bit more well-known in the trail world, but we do mm-hmm. sell more road shoes, right? Overall. And so I think that that's exciting for us is that we get to play in both spaces. And most most road brands are going to try to get in the trail and all the trail brands are trying to get in the road. And yep. we're yes. one of the only brands that get to do both, which is pretty exciting. And I think you're going to continue to see innovation in both arenas. Cool. And I know you can't, you may not be able to answer this question fully. So you can say, sorry, I can't answer that. But uh, are there shoes that are going to be coming out that will have more offerings with a, a, a lower drop option uh, for consumers? And when it comes to kind of the top end racing models, um, what are the next iterations looking like and what, what can people expect? And again, I know that there's times and places to talk about that stuff and this might not be it, but might as well ask. Well, let's, let's talk about it. Brian, do you want to take the honors? Or do you want yeah, me to? I'll, I'll chime in. I, I've been, um, you know, we've gone through various iterations of the Escalante and I'm really excited. I've worked closely with the team. That's kind of been my, one of my baby shoes as well, at least for the road. Um, and we're relaunching those. And I think we've distilled down every best iteration of the Escalante into this new Escalante 4. We also have an Escalante Racer 2, and that shoe hasn't been updated 
ever. So um, I think <laughs> I've been asking for are, that for a long time. <laughs> yes. You and a lot of other people. So I know. Yeah. in terms of maybe additional models, there might not be a ton of new models going in there is as they're going to be more into say like the forward category where we only have one and we're going to add two more in May, yep. but we are going to continue to update fine tune and press some of those lower cushion models that we're not going to take the gas off of those. So I'm really excited. I think the Lone Peak 8 is awesome. I'm Currently just finished up a testing round of the Lone Peak 9 for next year, and I'm continually stoked, Alex, okay? So um, your job is safe because the Lone Peak is <laughs> in now. good hands, right? <laughs> and um, we'll talk about that with the Lone Peak 10 in a couple years. But um, uh, the Escalante Racer and the Escalante 4, I am absolutely stoked for these updates. I really think that these are great updates. So that lower stack height fan, I think, is going to have some really awesome offerings from us coming out new. Um, so that that may, I'll maybe chime in on that that minimal part, and then Alex, you can maybe talk more on the fast product updates. Yeah. So not, so, did, did Alex did he does he get an exceeds expectations for the yearly review? Is that what I'm hearing? I'm yes. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. I, I'm, I'm giving him a like, two thumbs up. I'm just kidding. Got it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. For uh, so we'll we'll actually have more Ford product here coming out yep. in May, um, which is exciting. So another another road shoe, and then bringing it out on the trail, um, mm. which which is awesome, and and really it's it's delivering effectively that, that same ride. Um, you know, one, one's going to have more guidance features and then the other will be, will be on trail. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not talking too much about it, but we are, we are really excited to, to bring those out. Uh, and then, yeah, new, <clears throat> excuse me, new Vanish Carbon, uh, will be coming out, uh, kind of late spring, early summer timing is, is what we're looking at. And, and that's a great update. You know, we, we've been able to update Ego Pro, uh, to get just more out of it. You know, I, we're, we're fortunate to be a part of this this kind of race right now of getting just incredible compounds that that are they just perform so well. Um, we are moving to a full carbon fiber plate as well in the, the Vanish Carbon Two, which is really exciting. Uh, but what I you know we kind of go back to, which we're really excited about, still a, a very flexible asymmetrically a asymmetrical asymmetrically flexible carbon fiber plate. This one's actually more flexible than the Vanish Carbon mm -hmm. One, cool. um, so that's that's been fantastic. And I mean, the shoe, the shoe runs just exceptionally smooth. Um, so we're, we're pumped to get that out. Frank Lotto will actually be running in a pair, yep. uh, at, a uh, at trials. Yeah. Yep. She's it's hard to believe it's already trials, I know. but, um, so yeah, that's, that's exciting. What we will have a, a carbon plated trail product as well yep. coming out. So we're going to have the Mont Blanc carbon, um, yeah. which is, Awesome. I, the, the team did a great job. Our, our innovation team really spearheaded that. And um, yeah, it's, it's going to be incredible. You know, we, we know carbon on the trail is, is a little tough and, you know, experience on the, the road doesn't necessarily translate to the trail. Um, and the team did an unbelievable job well, making sure that wasn't a one to one. Awesome. It's it's really, really incredible, that Mont Blanc Carbon. And, you know, we had athletes racing Mont Blanc last August in that shoe, right? So this has been something that's been tested yep. um, quite a bit. And I think that efficiency with the carbon acting as a stone guard and um, yeah. a, an accelerator for the Ego Pro above it, right? Um, it's really, really good, great innovation from our team uh, that we're awesome. coming out with this year. So we have a lot of nerds who listen to this podcast, and they care about – what are the foams that like what what what's the base level of the foam is it an eva is it piba is it whatever can you tell us more about um ego pro and kind of what what sort of compound y'all have chosen for it and what you know about its properties and that kind of thing if you could tell us yeah yeah i mean why not that's why we're right. here right um yeah <laughs> we're here so, first. Uh, no, just kidding. <laughs> ego, ego pro is a uh you know it's a, it's a tpe derived foam so it's, it's a piva based foam uh it is super critically foamed so it does does go through the super critical fluid process goes in the autoclave you know all the all the very technical stuff um the specific gravity on it's you know super low so that's that's what's able to kind of keep that that weight down um softer right that's we, we can go super soft now and, and still have something that's responsive so that's what's really exciting about it um that's probably about as much as I'd want to share with this, but yeah, yeah. That's great. P so it is Piba. It is Piba based. I did not know that. Yeah, it is. It is a, a Piba based foam. Yeah, that's great. Cool. Sweet. So we are 
creeping up at an hour. So Matt, do you have one final question you want to ask them or do either of you have one final thing you want to share before we wrap things up? I do have a question that I I have to ask, but (laughs) yeah, you have to do it then. I have to do it. So I have to admit that the ultra forward experience might have the best heel bevel I have ever experienced. And for those that listen or read the channel, know that that or read or read our stuff, know that's really important given the intensity with which I slam into the ground, regardless of (laughs) what drop or shoe trying to change my biomechanics. Um, I'm really curious of what went into that. And, and because, you know, I see differences here versus, you know, the paradigm of super stability models have more of a posterior flare versus the, the forward has a massive bevel, which for someone like me is it's like butter. It just is so smooth. I don't know how to know how to ask this question, but what went into creating that bevel there, which is because to me, it's interesting to have a, Matt, the bevel that large on a four millimeter drop shoe. And, and to be honest, that is what most high drop shoes should have because it really helps smooth out that transition that can be quite jarring. So I'm just curious what went into the thought process on that because I like it. I mean, this this goes back to even, you know, non, non-dropped non product or non-elevated yeah. you know elevated heel product um, of just really trying to match the calcaneus, right? And, yeah. and keep that shape and um, again, I go back to before I officially started with the brand and Brian was, was up there at, at a sales meeting talking about it, right. Where <clears throat> we don't want to flare it out. We don't want to create this lever. Um, really, Thank we just you. want it to be as close as possible. So it's, that's all Brian, um, yep. you know, Brian and, and it, that was, that was something that he taught me and, and we were very, very aware of that, right. We didn't want to extend out. We didn't want to, to flare it. And, um, it just really creates a much smoother feel. And I mean, Brian, I don't know if you have any, like deep cuts on that yeah when you guys i mean it, it really you nailed it right we're just trying to match what the human body does with the calcaneus right trying to maximize what a, an amazing piece of engineering the human foot is right and how do we get a lot of our inspiration whether it's you know um you know our our Flex zones, you know, are going to be following the metatarsal joints. You know, we just really try to take inspiration from the human body that we don't consider the human body a problem, right? We consider it pretty amazing. We always call it the bio heel internally, yep. but I guess legal, we couldn't, we couldn't get any, I guess that wouldn't pass legal. So internally, we always call this. it the bio yeah. heel. So, um, yeah, the legal teams, we don't need to end there, but, um, uh, we, 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 that's what we've always <laughs> called it, right. Is the bio hill. That's been our internal, again, trying yeah. to get the inspiration from our human, um, body. And we've tried to do that, um, fairly successfully across the board, right. Just really trying to be inspired by that. And, you know, the strongest canted lugs on all of our trail shoes are right over your metatarsals, yeah. right. Uh, which is maximum, um, protection and where you're going to be able to get a little bit more propulsion and so forth from. So we, we just try to do some of those little things. And, um, I'm glad, uh, Matthew, that it, it works well for you because I think it does make the shoe faster. Right. And that's one of the goals was, was to get a little bit of a faster, poppier feel in an ultra where some of our, our shoes, you know, h- historically haven't had that in that cushion levels. And so, Again, just trying to give different experiences for different people. Yeah, I, I was I didn't know that going into that shoe, and I was like, why do I keep ending up doing workouts in this shoe every time <laughs> I put it on? Like, this is not. I mean, I'm not supposed to be doing this because I tell my patients not to do every run like that. But you know, <laughs> it's just you know geometries of people responding. So I appreciate the yep. candidness. I also appreciate all of your time tonight, by the way, and, and letting us geek out together because I think I, I've known this from external sources hearing how geeky ultra is and brian and golden and everybody there about looking at biomechanics so it's appreciate being able to confirm this but also the additional thing i will say the forward experience and being able to have the four millimeter drop there or whatever drop you want to you know it drop is relative given depending how you load it but giving options for people is really important it's nice to hear that because i think oftentimes when you say the word natural or minimalist or that kind of stuff, you start thinking sometimes a little like z kind of stuff, like getting a little bit extremist. So it's nice yep. to hear, again, talking about differentiating between, hey, we have certain products that this is how we do this, like the Lone Peak. This is going to be this is going to be a certain way because we have not only Brian, who you cannot change this or he will get very upset, but you also have a huge consumer base where if you change that, you're going to get things going to get really, really upset. 
I think you know this, but there's been some interesting like research that came out that Ultra has one of the highest, what was the term? Like the the highest customer loyalty uh, yeah. compared to most other brands that like it's like 70, 80 percent of individuals that wear Ultra tend to get another pair. So, you know, it's good that it's it, that you're creating variety and trying to meet the needs of the consumer that are going to be it, have increased variability as they start coming to your brand, but also recognize that you're going to have some people that this is what they want. And so I, I appreciate that flexibility because that can be very difficult from a product design standpoint, especially when you're talking about your essence and things like that. So it's we appreciate you sharing that, too. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't want to speak yeah. for Brian, but I mean, we probably could have talked for like another hour. I mean, just kind of yeah. geeking out on this stuff. Right. So thank you, guys. Yeah, it get it gets the, the the nerdiness gets even much more layered. Weird. It's like an onion yeah. with us. Yeah. So we appreciate you know, we're that. We're happy to, to to do it. And thanks for having us on. We really yeah. appreciate it. We love um, with that background and being a little different. We like to kind of push the limits of footwear and science. And and it's been fun as a brand to be able to do that. And thank you for for participating. And I'm glad it sounds like you've had some good experiences in Ultra, which is oh. our goal. So. Now we might have to have you back on because we might have to start peeling back some some of those onion layers. I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> That'd be great. I'd love to be on again. So thanks again for having us. Really Absolutely. appreciate it, and um, you you are awesome. So. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. And if you are following and you want to talk about your experience, we never brought up our, we usually give a subjective of the day. So our subjective of the day is, have you tried Ultra before? What's been your experience? And if you haven't, what have been the things that have held you back? Um, so you can comment below. And if you are following this podcast and you like what you've been hearing, leaving a review really does help this podcast continue to grow. And um, otherwise, you can continue to follow us on our website, doctorsofrunning.com. And you can come on any of the social media outlets that exist at Doctors of Running. So thanks again, you two, for joining us. And we'll see you all next time.